Mama did it, grandmama did it, dad did it, so I did it. I just, I just, you're my friend now. And I took that as she's sorry. <laughs> I just took it as she's sorry, but I made sure she was comfortable until she passed away. I'm just saying that some of this stuff came down from people don't even know why they are like they are, because that's just the way it was. But again, like I said, I know that I'm African American. I'm proud to be African American. I didn't kill anybody, and I know it's all out here. But we are here one tonight as one. And someone said, what can we do? When you do something, commit. Don't, don't do it just to say, I did this, and then you're gone. I've been, I've been with victims of Milwaukee violence for the last four years, alone. I do grief support, I raise money, I'm sitting with these families, I'm praying with these families, I'm making sure that they have what they, I'm fighting all kinds of systems to make sure they have what they need. Yes, we, some people could make better decisions, but that's for us to, if we're going to be out there, commit, let's help. I also really quickly wanted to, I wanted to respond to the lady who asked the question about helping as well. There's also an organization in Milwaukee called Surge, showing up for racial justice. They do a ton of support and ally work. Uh, they also do a lot of training and development for people who are interested in getting in this work, but may not be sure about how to do that who they need to talk to, how to contact, and it is um, mostly, it's, it's a white organization that supports black organizations, supports and does a lot of ally work. I would suggest you look them up if that's something that you're interested in. If you want to find a, like an entry point, I would definitely suggest showing up for racial justice. They're on Facebook, and I can get you the contact information if you are interested in that. A sort of comment about that, what can white people do, and then another question to pay back on that. Um, so I'm a, a healthcare provider, I'm a psychiatrist, and I work on public health issues and health disparities in health. So it's something I study and know that we can examine our implicit bias to improve the um, outcomes for people of color who don't see faces of color in their healthcare team and therefore suffer um, with injustices that range from overdiagnosis to undertreatment to poorer outcomes. So I know what needs to be done in the healthcare environment and I, I call on all my brethren who might be here who are in healthcare to um, look at cases um, from a population health point of view, look at your cases and see where you might be um, overdiagnosing, underdiagnosing or providing barrier, inadvertently putting up barriers to treatment um, by the way we structure healthcare. Um, but I want to ask about um, Christian spaces of fellowship because um, the racial discrimination from New Orleans and so a lifelong Episcopalian but new Milwaukeean. And um, I want to find out how we can make um, spaces of worship more welcoming for people of color so that we can enter into a deeper fellowship in our religious life to work on the discrimination that exists in our religious communities. I'd like to answer that question. Um, one of the things I think uh, congregations can do are things, currently what you're doing already, uh, making room for places and spaces for people to come uh, within the congregation and from the community to really be able to have a safe place to talk about racism. I think that that is one of the things that there hasn't been traditionally a place that white folks have thought of as being safe and so they avoid asking certain questions and things like that and they don't know what to do and, and, and everything like that and so they kind of stay in the same place and they don't grow spiritually. Racism, your racism journey is a spiritual journey just like a faith journey is. And we have to, and white folks need to really understand that. And that's why I say you have to consistently be working at your racism journey, your own individual uh, racism journey, uh, people around you in your circles, and then to the greater um, policies, uh, you know, with government and nonprofits and things like that, because that's what it's going to take to really, really deal with racism work um, as it is. 
I know that to change a church system, I, I come from a denomination that is in this state, I believe that we are probably about 95% white. I'm United Methodist, so I'm with the United Methodist Church. I'm sure with the Episcopal Church, I don't know what the percentage is, but I know that the Episcopal Church is a predominantly white congregation. And people need to really kind of change their attitudes, church folks do. They expect people to come into their building and just kind of come into their church and, oh, we're going to be welcoming. The thing is, is that you need to be able to get out of your own box and get out of your own community and start to show up in places. But when you show up in those places, this is what I tell, my, tell all folks, but particularly my white brothers and sisters, make sure that you are in the right spiritual place to do that work. And you are not going to be going in there trying to fix somebody. And going to be doing something for someone. You have to be in the mindset of Jesus. And going to do something with them and work with them where they are. Because if we have attitudes of, of people, I'm going to do something for this. I'm going to be a teacher because I'm going to help those poor black kids. Because they're living in crime communities because there's so much black on black crime. Now we, I'm sure that folks have said, have said that, I've heard that from people why they've gone into mm -hmm. teaching. I, I hate to say this from some of my white friends, mm -hmm. but that you can't go into those communities with that kind of, of, of attitude. It has to be a very, as humbling as possible attitude. And then also look of who are you inviting into your home on a regular basis, and it's not, not just the one token black friend beyond that. And that is something that you have to kind of really also to look at. I just really quickly wanted to say something as well. My bishop actually, I go to Parkline Assembly of God on Fond du Lac and Roosevelt, and my bishop was actually just talking about it. He said our church is going to be experiencing the year of community. And a lot of, like Lisa said, it takes us going out of these four walls. Out of these four walls, and if your neighbors look just like you, then you have to go and find a space where you can go and connect with people, whether it's a coffee shop, whether it's at a park, and engage with people. Just Say hello, have a conversation. But it has to start outside of the church's four walls because yeah, you're, a, lot, a lot of people are not coming, they're not coming and visiting churches anymore. Black churches, white churches, people are not coming in by the droves anymore. The work is outside of the churches. And not only is it outside of the churches, it starts with relationship building. And where are you doing your relationship building? Are you doing it at work? Are you doing it in these other places that you're going with? Are all of your circles, do they all look the same? That's where it can start, right in your own intimate circles, having those conversations with your families and with your friends, and then expanding yourself in those different places. But just like Lisa said, but checking your heart motive. Why are you expanding into those spaces? Like, is there, are you going because you think you're going to be the white savior? Or are you going because you actually truly have a heart for people and you want to connect and get to know? Or guys, actually, I want to get to know about, you know, where you came from. You know, I want to know what your story is. And in that way, let's start to break bread that way. And I just want to make one comment because I know we have a question over there and that lady's been waiting for a while. But I wanted to say this because I come from a similar but different perspective than these two. Uh, I'm a Christian, but I believe that the church has done a lot of damage to our communities. And so I think that, you know, as I work with young people these days, um, the church is supposed to represent hope. It's supposed to represent faith. And with the, you know, the, the, the hundreds of thousands and millions of people who consider themselves Christians, the one thing that people, the young people are looking for is where's the work? Because if they, are, if they believe in God and God is love, then where's the love? Because I'm not seeing the love, you know? And so we've got to, as Christians, have to do a better job at showing that there is love out here in order to give these young people hope. The reason that these people are killing each other is because they don't have hope. They don't have love. They don't have the basic needs of, of human conditioning to feel value within themselves. So when I think about people who kill other people, it's because there's something that they're saying is not in them that gives them a reason to want to stop and not to do that thing. And so what we've got to do and what the church, I feel, has to do is really start coming together. You know, I'm not a part of a, a church home. 
when I was growing up, I grew up Lutheran, then I grew up Baptist, then I grew up everything else you can imagine. Depending on who I was living with, that's what I was, right? But even as a young person, the one thing that I realized is that I'm choosing a church almost like the local gang is trying to recruit me. You know? Over here, if they're Pentecostal, they can or can't do that. Over here, they're Baptist and they can or can't do that. So people say, you know what, I want to go over there because I can do that if I'm over there. Well, hold on, that's not the way you're supposed to be able to pick it, right? So I think that we've got to do a better job at coming together because the more that we can show a collective, you know, as Christians, and even if you're not Christian, if you just got love in your heart, the collective of love and humanity says that we all have a right to be here, and I'd rather you be here than not, because you could be the person that changes the world next. It is it is the young people that are the next doctors that are going to find the cure for cancer, even though folks have been looking at it, looking for it for decades. But we don't give that kid a chance. We don't give that kid hope to be able to say, you know what? I have value. I have substance. And if I don't necessarily even get it within my immediate family, I know that the love of just people that I could come into, into you know, interact with, they're going to give me even sometimes that love that I'm not getting at home. So when you walk past a kid and they might look at you and you don't speak and then they don't speak either, say hello, hey, how you doing? Because those sorts of things make a difference just in terms of human existence. And if we want to get back to a common denominator, the common denominator truly has to be the love that we have for not only our lives, but others' lives. Because what happens is we devalue other people's lives. What makes you think they're not coming after yours? Because if they don't have any value within their own, then what's stopping them from coming and breaking into your, into your home and saying, well, if I get shot, I get shot, but I know I want that TV. So we've got to be able to you know, look at ourselves internally and, and truly for everybody to say, you know what, what do I stand for? What do I represent? And if God is love, then that means that, you, that love should be exuding out of you 24-7. Because the, what, the one thing that happens is if you don't exude love, then people start to question who you are. Because even for me, I mean, I believe that it's a Christian's duty and a responsibility to be there and to look out for those that don't have much or anything. So at the end of the day, while we have all of these social justice programs and organizations, the church, God has ordained everybody here to be responsible, to be messengers, to be disciples, to be the ones that give back to those that don't have. And the more and more that we can show that as a collective and, 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 and come together in our different circles and different churches saying, you know what, we're not going to be over here in our church session today. We're going to go somewhere and we're going to have three, four congregations mingling together and we're going to have service as a community. That's right. And then you invite those community members who don't yet know God. Because when you look at it this way, right, if you know God, there's no way that you kill somebody. And that's really what it comes down to. So when we look at our young people, when we talk about the state and the, and the way that our world is going in today, it is the young people. Because fortunately for everybody in here who has her, you know, if you found God and you believe in that, you got that, right? What about the souls who don't have them, who've never been exposed to even know that he's out there? That it, and because they're supposed to see it in every person that considers themselves a Christian. So I'll get off my soapbox and we'll take this question over here. Um. I guess I'm, okay. I guess I, I wasn't going to ask a question per se, but I was just going to um, give a response um, to what this woman asked earlier about what we can do. And I'm in the field of education, and I just see that within education, there's, first of all, a great deal of inequity between the schools, and also um, in in the education field, we have not taught the history of racism within the schools, and we have not taught um, the um, contributions of the African American community um, either. And so I think that um, that's a great fault within the educational system. And so if there's something that you wanna do, um, what, whatever educational system that you're part of, stand up and um, talk in those educational systems to um, people, school board members, um, superintendents, whoever you need to talk with about what is needed within our educational systems. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, the, the heart of the story of Christ is the victory of hope over fear. We were talking about hope. I know that's one of your favorite words. Um, and that is what I feel called to do. Um, hope is the thing that's going to get us out of the door. It's not a luxury. It's a necessity. We need to find that within ourselves. The power of hope and love is what's going to make us connect with our brothers and sisters. And none of us are free. People who look like me are not free. My son is not free. As long as we are made into moral monsters by the system of white supremacy, we will not be free. The work of getting everybody free together is what Jesus calls us to do. We are all in this together. That's what I have to say. Good evening. My name is Michelle Mooney, and um, I'm one member of an organization called Common Ground. Common Ground is made up of about 50 churches, schools, universities, small businesses who want to work for progressive change in the met met metropolitan area. We're asking, what can we do? Well, I assume all of you, because you're not home watching TV, that you're interested in doing something. But so often you can't do it alone. You've got to be in solidarity with some other folks and face the people in power that bring injustice. And I want to give you one example if you're interested in doing something. I found out in my own heart about Black Lives Matter when two of my African American pastor friends who are rock bottom pastors in Sherman Park were driving home in Waukesha from a fishing trip and their tire blew and they sat by the side of the road and a Waukesha policeman came and said, not how can I help you, but what's your name, where's your license, are you insured? Do you have guns or drugs in your car? Yeah, I've that's called policing. <laughs> Will you let her finish, please? Now, Shut up. Michelle, go ahead. If that's not racial profiling, I don't know. Please what it is. get away from me. We now have a suit. There are lawyers here who have agreed, and there's been a suit filed on behalf of these two pastors. If any of you have an example, of racial profiling you'd like to share. I would love to see you back here at the end of that and get your name and number. And let's say you're a little old white lady like me. And maybe you can share, yeah, I was racially profiled well, by, I did something and all of that, I came over and he was so nice. He didn't do anything like that to me. We'd like to hear those stories too. So, I hope you'll come forward. We think that this is an important time in this four county area to stop racial profiling once and for all. Um, my name is Angela Resker, and um, I, I'm not as dark as I usually am, but um, I am half Latino. But my dad is German. I grew up in a home where mom was from Panama, dad's from Germany, and he was a kid. And raised as part of World War II and a member of Hitler Youth, because that was what was required. He always told me it was still by like being in the Boy Scouts. Um, he was 70 when he found out, whew, it's so good emotional, that his parents helped to hide and get Jews out of Munich. And he didn't know that his oldest uncle was really a half uncle and was half Jewish because the first grandmother had been Jewish. He was 70 when he found this out and he said to his aunt, why didn't I know? And she said, well, we couldn't tell you. We didn't know what you might say. 
So imagine that I've grown up in a household where my dad has been at the table and in a restaurant and used the N-word, and I have to say, I'm going to the other table. Or he says, oh, there's a bunch of spicks moving into the neighborhood, and I'm like, you know, except for you, that's everybody else in this household. So that's how I grew up. And then I went to Menominee Falls as the exec of the YMCA, and I had a guy tell me that he was dropping his membership because they had six black families in Menominee Falls. They knew where they were at all times. And why was he uh, telling me? Because he thought I was mulatto. And so I worked really hard in Menominee Falls to try and change some attitudes. And what I found by having a white male from Marquette University come and do diversity trainings in 1992. And I invited, we had 200 staff, so I had staff at each of those 20 sessions, and I had people in leadership roles, hospital board, village board, police chief, fire chief, at the table, having these conversations. Too often we focus just on Milwaukee. Too many people go from Milwaukee at night out to their suburbs where they keep it nice and white. And it's hard being that person of color walking into that community. It was the second one I was told in Cedarburg, Hayden Knight being the first. What we found was that people in their heart of hearts truly didn't want to be racist. Not in their heart of hearts. But they didn't even recognize what they put in place as systems. And I'm a very active Rotarian, but I sat at the tables when people talked about black on black crime and pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. And as much as I don't like hearing what you two young men said or want to say, I have to recognize that you aren't alone. And so if we really want to do something about this issue, we need to come to the table, all of us, and talk about what we have in common. Because I'll bet you anything, and sorry, I made some judgments here. I'll bet you have a tough time with some people who don't want to accept that you are an atheist. My brother is, and I know what he goes through. I'll bet you, I'm sorry, this might be offensive, but you probably have some problems with some people who talk to you about maybe you ought to lose a little weight. No, but, but uh, my, point, my point is, we all have those things that somebody judges us, judges us for. Every single one of us. So my point is, try to open your mind to what you maybe don't know. I'm going to let you. Okay, but... So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. My point is, this, this worked in Menominee Falls. I just want to say, Menominee Falls is more diverse than it was when I moved there in 1985. I'm proud of what I did, but it came at a price. And I remember sitting at the lunch table when the police chief said to me, Angie, it's time for you to pack your bags, and you're in an enviable position. You don't have money to pack. You're trying to make a community change in a direction it doesn't want to. Wow. And a bank president pushing me on my chest, asking who the hell was I, trying to change his community. He would be there, he was there before me, he would be there after me. So it comes at a price, but let's talk about the suburbs too, folks. Let's start getting people to the table and talk about what we have in common. And, and why do we want to immediately condemn that attitude which says, let's deal with black on black crime, or why um, do we want those people in our neighborhood, our community? We have to start talking about these things outside of Milwaukee. Thank you. Let me right, I would love to. I would love to. Responses? That's been a lot of the uh, comments. Um, I want to go back to the education, um, when someone talked about education. Uh, one of the things that uh, with racism has been talking about, what we've been doing, we've been also trying to see how we can assist folks who are dealing with, with racism. So one of the things that I've been um, dealing with is, um, or trying to assist with, is the situation that happened in Greendale. Do you guys remember that what happened in Greendale? Where the, where the black student got uh, suspended after the white girl called her 
the N word. And just so you know, as of now, the suspension has not been removed. And that was in September. So I just want to keep in mind and keep you to let you know that we have a very, very serious problem. So when the woman just talked about what's going on in the suburban areas, really you need to really look at your own communities, whether it's Whitefish Bay, uh, whether it's Shorewood, whether it's Mequon, Bayside. I could keep going on any of these kinds of things that we can be talking about. There is racism in all of those areas, and I can tell you there has been racist incidents in all of those schools. Whether you want to know it, or whether you don't know it or not, um, me, personally, I grew up in Bayside, so I, I grew up in a very, very white Jewish area. I went to Nicolet, and I can tell you that I got called the N-word multiple times in growing up. And now here at 50 years old and trying to see all the racist incidents that have become public. You have to remember, we didn't have all the stuff that became public. It's always been there. This is not, this is not, this is not uh, anything new. Black kids have been getting called the N-word or Muslim kids or whatever it is. That's been going on for a long time. So if you, if you aren't really looking at what's going on in your own home, your own community, your own schools, and yes, there's, there's institutional racism. All of the schools across the country, all the school districts have, have race gaps. There, there, isn't, there isn't anything that isn't indifferent in any of the schools. And that's because of institutional racism and how people deal. The suspension rates are always higher for black folks and native folks. It always is. Everywhere, and for the same types of, of incidents. So I just wanted to kind of bring us back to that, that there is a lot that you can do. Go to your school board. Are they doing anything for Black History Month? I mean, Black History Month is really for white folks. But, I mean, I'm black, so I, I read on history all the time. So every day, so I'm still black. So, it, you know, you don't have to tell me happy uh, uh, Black History Month. <laughs> I have a couple more questions back here. Is there any other more response from the from the committee? Or yeah, the uh, the one thing that I wanted to mention uh, again before I become long winded, I'll keep track of the show. Um, a lot of the issues that we discuss as it relates to the Black community, the Black Lives Matter movement, a lot of these, if not most of them, are all institutional. The root cause of the issues that we are seeing within our Black community are institutionally based. Yeah, yeah. When we think about the education, and we have the question over here about education, imagine if somebody told you that the quality of your education would be predicated on the house down the street, and you lived in 53206, where there is not too much home ownership, you know, you know, there's probably some, right? But if the quality of my education is based on where I live in my community, I'm not getting a fighting chance at all. And let's, again, we can just, Look at it for what it is. If the funds are not there to provide me the same quality education that someone in Shorewood can have because the homes next to Shorewood produce more property taxes than the home next to Washington High School, then there's a disparity. There's a gap. And at the same time, nobody's identifying that and saying, you know what, if this is a shortfall that we know is going to hinder education at its highest level, Who's going to step in? Right. Nobody does. And so then when they look at it and say, well, the black community graduation rates are low. Well, who can graduate from a facility that has not had an air conditioning system since 68? Mm -hmm. And you want to send a, a, a group of 400, 500, 600 kids in a building where they can't focus because it's too hot to focus. So when you think about the things that are affecting the black community, it's institutionally based. It's economically based, right? So when we think about the, the crime, crime happens, why? Because people want property, people want things, usually things that they can sell, whatever, just to make an extra buck, or whatever you want to call it. We failed the educational system so people don't qualify for jobs. If you don't graduate from high school, no sense of filling out a job application because one of the requirements is a high school graduate, you know, high school diploma, GD or something. 
But if something was put in place to hinder that success in the first place, why? It's logical to say that there's going to be high unemployment rates for the black community if they're not being educated to get jobs. That's just common sense. So what we try to do too often is look at a problem and say, it's something that they're doing that's causing this problem. And when you look at society as a whole, if you know the history of this United States of America, something in that, in that knowledge base is said, they're failing because they've been set up to fail. That's right. Because if they wanted me to, see, to succeed, I wouldn't have gotten here the way that I did, right? And when we think about, you know, uh, the ways that we can help, and again, I'm gonna answer this part of the question when we go. Um, the way that we can help truly, to, for, for me, it comes down to educating people who don't understand. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem is we spend so much time trying to change people's mind that we don't focus on the common-minded people that are already in the room. Because you can let an agitator get everybody in the room all up in arms, but we're all up in arms because we are on the same team. We get it. So how come we're not working more together because we do get it and we defy what the other narrative is and now our team is bigger than theirs? Because trust me, it's already bigger than theirs. We just have not realized that we're all on the same team. They have though. They realize that they're on the same team already and they're playing together. It is just those individuals that really want what's better for everyone that's trying to do it by themselves or confused about how to do it. But truly, we come together and we'll see the change that we want to see. And I know we have some questions. Years ago, I belonged to a church where we had testimony. So I'm going to give a testimony. Not to take that. Because I'm hoping and yelling and clapping and everything. But two things happened to me, well, many things, but two very important things happened to me in the past several years. I found out that my biological pit clock is, could very well come to its ebbing time. And then I had a DNA test done. And that was so revealing. And I found out that um, I'm not an immigrant. I'm Native American to certain parts of Mexico. So my people did not immigrate to this Americas. The next thing I found out that I'm, not, I'm hardly even Spanish. I'm Scottish and I'm Irish. Whoa. I've spent a whole lifetime learning two languages both of which are the conquerors, and I don't know my native language. But there is this tiny little part that I found out is African. So my daughter's here to confirm what I'm going to tell you. Since that time, I have spent either on 